All right. After our long discussion on different uh, long-range rifle features, like we're talking about barrels and action rigidity and triggers and stocks and everything else like that, I thought that a lot of you are going to probably want to see some different examples of uh, actual long-range rifle setups and uh, what they would be good for. Now, mind you, again, as we said before, that uh, you're going to be custom tailoring your particular rifle to your mission criteria. And uh, so, for example, if you're a hunter, you're going to have a different rifle than if you're a long-range target shooter or if you're on a hard target interdiction team or whatever you're going to be doing, you're going to match the rifle to your application. And before I get ahead of myself here, I just want to remind everyone that no matter which rifle you choose, it can be made to shoot very well. We're talking even old military rifles or, uh, you know, rifles that may not be very uh, famous for producing very good accuracy. But uh, if you do your harmonic tuning and load development and uh, get all the things squared away that we talked about in a harmonics video, even that old junker you got in the back of your gun cabinet should be able to meet your uh, accuracy requirements of uh, less than one minute of angle for our long range applications, even if it takes a little bit of work. But uh, accuracy requirements are not going to be your only criteria for your rifle selection, as we talked about before. You're going to first basically choose a cartridge. That's going to be your first thing. So if you missed the preceding videos, you're going to want to go through the series and check them out. We did cartridge selection. So once you got your cartridge down, that kind of narrows your choices. Uh, for example, if you have a big monster cartridge like a 338 Lapua Magnum, you're going to have uh, somewhat narrow down uh, weapons selection criteria. There's only certain rifles made that will uh, chamber that round. So you can rule out a whole bunch of them right there. And so that's how you're going to narrow this down. If you, uh, if you want to use a 308, that's what you chose for your uh, cartridge. You're going to have a lot more options when it comes to rifle selection. So again, you have to match the equipment to the mission. So uh, let's just go through some of these different rifles that we've been showing pictures of in these videos here and kind of show you what we got going on. Uh, this first rifle here is just, uh, this is actually my old hunting rifle. This is a Remington 780L, which was, it was a step under the BDL. This is probably 35 years old, this rifle. And uh, I had uh, Kurt's custom checkering actually recheckered it. So it looks, it looks nicer than it was when I, when I used it back when I was a kid. But uh, this rifle, I picked it up for $200, and uh, without any blueprinting of the action or any uh, lapping of the lugs or anything like that, it shoots half minute of angle. So although this is not a target configuration rifle, it's got your standard uh, hunting skinny contour barrel. It's uh, relatively uh, lightweight. It's not a lightweight rifle, but it's definitely a lot lighter than a target configuration it's uh, very, very portable, and it's uh, perfect for what it was designed for. This is a hunting rifle, so if uh, someone wants a long-range hunting rifle for large game, this uh, something like this would be very, very adequate. All you would have to do is basically equip this with uh, the proper optic, and uh, if you get sub-minute of angle out of this thing and you have the power required to take down whatever game it is you're shooting at, this will work just fine. And actually, I would recommend... A hunting rifle like this over uh, a target configuration in in the case of even if you want to go out beyond a thousand meters there's no need really if uh, for hunting applications to have that full bore target set up if you planned on carrying this rifle around and maybe only taking one or two critical shots per season this will work just fine now mind you you are gonna have to zero this thing and confirm your zero so you're gonna shoot it more than one or two times even though it's just a hunting rifle uh, long range shooting does require a lot of practice. So that's going to be the downfall to a light rifle like this, especially in a heavier caliber like a 7mm Magnum. This uh, does have some recoil to it. So if you're sensitive to recoil or uh, even if you're not, this thing is going to be uncomfortable to shoot a lot. Uh, but it will work just fine nonetheless. Uh, the rifle will do its job fine. If you can put up with the recoil, then uh, this will work just fine. Let's go to uh, this. Here's one. This is a Savage Model 10. And uh, this is kind of an entry-level target rifle. This one's in a 308 caliber. This has a 20-inch barrel, and it's a, it's a bull barrel, a heavy barrel. And uh, this particular one, I believe, I forget what they call it. It's the tactical model. 
uh, Savage Model 10 FP or something like that. And it's got kind of the bigger bolt knob. That'll give you a little more leverage if you're uh, for uh, ejecting your rounds and stuff, lifting your bolt. And uh, this one has been uh, Duracoated. I Duracoated this for the guy who owns it. And it's equipped with uh, this FWSA uh, Super Sniper Scope on there. We'll get more into scope selection on our next video, actually, which should be a lot of fun. And uh, this is a good rifle if you got like $500 that you want to spend. You don't want to spend $1,500 on a rifle. This works just fine. This shoots pretty good. Uh, there's been range reports that these guys shoot like quarter minute of angle with the right loads. I haven't got quarter minute of an angle out of this particular rifle. I've got more like one minute of angle out of it. And I did do some extensive load development. Sometimes the harmonics are real uh, tricky to get squared away, especially when uh, this particular rifle has kind of an injection molded plastic stock and the bedding is not that good really. I mean, if a guy wanted to really get this uh, the full potential out of this, you could uh, do some glass bedding of the action. Would definitely straighten that out. But uh, for the purposes of the person who owns this rifle, and they're not going to be shooting past 300 meters, so uh, this uh, setup will work just fine. And it uh, the recoil is not too bad. It's a little bit heavier a rifle. And for an entry-level uh, weapon, that's not a bad choice. And in the 308 caliber, you know, it's, it's a great choice for tactical applications for a uh, having plenty of ammo available out there what else do we got here okay this looks like the uh, Winchester model 70 this is another this is kind of a target varmint configuration this one happens to actually be in a 223 but uh, they, they do come in other uh, cartridges as well but even the 223 you know if you want to do long-range shooting with that if uh, your cartridge criteria you know demanded a 223 would be best for your if you're a varmint hunter or something and you don't have a lot of wind to worry about, this might be a good setup. Now, one thing uh, to note when you're choosing your varmint rifles is a lot of these varmint rifles have barrel twists that are designed for light bullets. So that's the one thing you're going to want to be aware of when you're choosing your long-range rifle setup is because, as we discussed in our bullet dynamics and bullet selection video, you're going to be using heavy projectiles for long-range applications. So a lot of these varmint rifles, uh, they might have a twist that is not enough to stabilize that long bullet. So that's something you definitely want to be mindful of. And uh, although I've gotten away with, uh, you know, retrofitting varmint style rifles in the past to shoot very well with heavy bullets, it, you might not be that lucky as I was. So this uh, particular one, this is a Winchester Model 70, excellent shooting rifle. This shoots half minute of angle out of the box. I forget what they're going for. They're probably around $750 or something like that. You can find it for. And uh, that's a really, it ha comes with a real nice stock and a uh, stainless steel heavy barrel. I believe that's a HS Precision stock, if I'm not mistaken, which is a pretty good stock that comes on these rifles. Uh, this next rifle here, this is my old Ruger, actually. And this is in a bunch of my videos as well. This is an old uh, Ruger M77 VT, which is the Varmint Target model, and a 243 Winchester. It actually came with a, kind of a matte-colored stainless steel 26-inch uh, semi-heavy target barrel. And uh, it came with the laminated, like, target uh, contour stock. And then I Duracoated it just a couple years ago. I got this rifle in 99, and I put a lot of rounds through it. And some things to note with these Ruger rifles is uh, in the VT, they have a very nice target trigger as compared to the other M77s. Now, one thing, uh, I've been shooting M77s for a long time. as kind of what I learned on as a kid, too, is uh, I had an 03 Springfield that I learned on, but my other rifle that I got to use was an M77 in a 6mm in a hunting rifle. And that thing happened to be very accurate. But some of the other M77 Rugers I've had uh, that were uh, constructed in the 1990s, I don't know what happened, but uh, there was some really poor bedding on some of those rifles, and even some of the barrel quality was really poor. And a lot of those Rugers actually did not perform that well. You're getting like two and a half minute of angle out of some of those things, or even worse, I've heard other people have problems with. Most of that could be corrected with uh, bedding the rifle. This M77 VT, when I got it in 99, this is before Ruger re-outfitted their factories with uh, new machining equipment and uh, new, new methods of machining. They really straighten it out now, but this is made kind of when they were not as good. 
but still it's shot like uh, for uh, one minute of angle, you know, one and a quarter minute of angle, which is about one and a quarter inch group at 100 yards, which uh, kind of disappointed me at first. But uh, as I got to know the rifle a, le- a little better, I came to f- uh, find out that actually this rifle shoots much, much better when the bore is completely loaded with copper fouling. Now, this is a phenomenon we're going to talk about in more detail later on when we talk about making what people call cold bore shots. And uh, we're going to straighten out some of the uh, misconceptions uh, about that as well. Actually, there's a probably better term for it. And there's a lot more going on than just your bore being cold. But uh, it has to do with your bore being dirty in, or seasoned or uh, properly built up with copper fouling. And there's other things that go into that as well. But some rifles actually shoot a lot better when the bore has reached its consistency uh, of fouling. As the the bore is perfectly clean, its uh, the, its dimensions are a little wider. And as you shoot it and shoot it and shoot it, it builds up a, a, a tiny, tiny film of copper fouling in it. And uh, it'll change the bore dimensions. And after, after enough rounds, it kind of stabilizes. It reaches an equilibrium point. And it doesn't get dirtier because when each bullet flies through, it kind of wipes out what you have. And so you finally get a consistent bore size. And that's why some rifles seem to shoot better when they're dirty, which is very interesting. If I This thing right now, here's a group I can show you a picture of, is shooting very, very well right now. And that's just uh, shooting real fast, just kind of laying down. I'm not in a bench rest or with sandbags or anything. But it'll shoot like this all day long. If I was to actually clean this rifle out, if I was to get out the bore brush and just go to town on it, it would go back to one and a half inch groups until uh, maybe 50 or 100 rounds later when I got the bore seasoned again and uh, I had a new buildup of copper falling. It would, sh- it would shrink it down. So that's something to be aware of. Another thing with this particular rifle that I did is I went and glass bedded it and I also free floated it as this, this the fit of the stock and the barrel into the action was absolutely atrocious. It was really, really bad. And uh, that helped out a little bit, actually, but uh, it, it was mostly the fouling. After I after I straightened out the stock and the free floating, it still only shot one minute of angle until I, I got it fouled up, then it shot better. But uh, And I didn't get into this in too much detail on our harmonics video, but the reason people free float barrels in a nutshell is that if you have tension on one side of the barrel and you don't have it on the other, like if your uh, stock is out of alignment and your barrel's rubbing up against one side of the channel, uh, that can definitely throw off your harmonics if you got the barrel you know, and having a standing wave going on and, and the vibrations are reverberating down the barrel and then it inconsistently vibrates and touches the side there. It'll change your uh, your pattern for each shot depending on, you know, how your stock is. And wood stocks do have a tendency to have a slight amount of flex with temperature and humidity variations. So it'll flex a different amount, which will touch your barrel in a different amount. It's just a bad deal. So that's why a lot of guys, just to get that headache out of there, is they go ahead and remove all the wood in the barrel uh, channel so that the barrel does not have any chance to touch the side there, throwing off the harmonics. Uh, So that seemed to help out the rifle a little bit. And uh, this thing has actually been a real good shooter. I've uh, made hits on 12-inch plates with this little two forty three out to 1375 which is pretty dang far for that tiny little cartridge. That's about the max range for that cartridge. I, I, I probably couldn't duplicate that very often, actually. It's, uh, it's getting pretty unstable at that range. But uh, this is a, a real good little rifle. It, it cost me about uh, four ninety nine back in 1999. I don't know what they run now, probably $600 or something like that. And uh, they do have an integral scope mount. I do like the Ruger M77 actions. They're, they're patterned very closely off the original Mauser 98 action in a lot of ways. But uh, one of the nice features is they don't have a separate scope base like your Remington 700 Winchester Model 70s are going to have a separate scope base. And uh, so this one has integral scope mounts, Ruger. And actually to get this 30 millimeter scope to fit on here, I, put, I actually use Leopold rings. And they, uh, another thing about the Ruger that's kind of nice is they have a spring release floor plate, which uh, is kind of a nice feature. But, you know, I could talk for an hour on these various features on these rifles, but the Rugers aren't bad if you work the bugs out of them and be aware of your bar- barrel fouling.
All right, this next rifle here is a Remington Model 700 Police Sniper Rifle. And uh, I think they made these in 300 Winchester Magnum, 308, and this one actually is a 7mm Remington Magnum, which is one of my actual favorite long-range cartridges in the standard belted Magnums. It's a great cartridge, but uh, this one is equipped with the one-piece Weaver scope mount, which we'll talk more about scope mounts probably in our optics selection video, but that's a good way to increase uh, action rigidity, as we talked about before. It comes with a nice stock. The Remington... Uh, Sniper rifles and some of their target environment configurations are, are real good rifles. Again, you want to be mindful of your twist. And uh, talking about barrel twist, the, the sniper rifles are going to be pretty good. Or you're, uh, if you're in the Remingtons, you want to look at the Senderos or some of those rifles more. They're going to be more of a large game rifle. So be aware of your twist. A, a varmint style uh, Remington Model 700 is going to normally be equipped with a twist rate that's going to try to stabilize really light bullets. You're going to be shooting at gophers. And long-range shooting, we're going to be using long bullets. So uh, the Senderos or the police sniper rifles are a little better, I think. Uh, that's This is a real good rifle. This one is, uh, we go, we went and uh, actually installed a muzzle brake on here. Loudener, as I like to call them. They make the rifle a lot more loud. They do increase uh, felt recoil. And we'll talk more extensively about muzzle brakes in one of our upcoming videos because that's a... That's a subject that's going to take at least one entire video. There's some very strange effects that happen that affect the technique on how you have to shoot your long-range rifles, sometimes especially in big bores when we're talking about muzzle brakes. But if you, uh, I would not recommend muzzle brakes unless you absolutely have to have them. Now, for a, a rifle like this, 7mm Magnum, that's right on the border of... Uh, that's a pretty sharp, uncomfortable rifle to shoot if you're going to be laying down on your stomach all day, prone, sending them one right after the other. So uh, a, a muzzle brake can actually tame her right down, make it a real pussycat to shoot. There are better ways to deal with the recoil, and we'll probably do a video. We'll add it in here someplace, I don't know where, on different ways of recoil reduction. Uh, your main ways, obviously, is the weight. You increase the weight of your rifle. That uh, reduces felt recoil. Uh, my favorite way after weight to reduce felt recoil is a mercury recoil suppressor, which can be installed inside the stock, which is unseen. It's just a, it's a kinetic energy kind of deal, and it's a little tube of mercury, actually. There's a blob of mercury that sloshes around in that tube, and that takes a lot of bite out of it in recoil. It takes the sharp impulse out of the rearward recoil as they shoot, and it's something that doesn't increase the sound or the blast for uh, anyone sitting behind the, the rifle. And uh, if you absolutely have to tame it down, like on a big caliber, like my 338s or any uh, the 50 M uh, BMGs, it's absolutely necessary on those things to, to actually use a muzzle brake. But uh, the Remington 700 is probably, that's kind of a fail-safe choice. If, if you don't know what to get and you're confused on all the different rifle options and you went with the Remington 700, that's kind of the standard. So you can't really go wrong with that particular rifle in their... Uh, they're very well respected. That's what all the custom uh, guys like to really use as their standard for the most part. And your military sniper rifles like the M40 and the M24 SWS that the U.S. Army uses and a lot of other ones are actually built on the Remington 700 action. And uh, so in the factory configuration, they do make, Remington makes these police sniper rifles and they make the a lot of different, there's all kinds of different rifles there for you to choose from when you're talking the Remingtons.